replace what oil is currently doing. That there is no way with whatever developments are made in renewables, you just can't get there. Right. Yeah, I, you know, I get emails almost on a daily basis from people who say, say well, you haven't considered this energy source or this one. And uh, occasionally there are you know, flashy stories in the, on the television about uh, a new kind of genetically engineered bacteria that excretes diesel fuel or whatever. <laughs> Some of these things may turn out to be really great sources of energy. The problem is, if they're not already off the drawing boards, if they're not already in commercial, commercialization, then we won't be able to depend upon them as, as really uh, important commercial sources of energy for two or three or four decades, because that's how slow the process is of building a new energy infrastructure. If it's not already a commercial source of energy, then we can more or less write it off as being helpful. There are, there are a lot of people who sort of might think, hooray, the idea of, you know, the growth has been the problem in a way, and yes. people might have seen that and recognized that this might right. be unsustainable. But their presumption then is that you go, you perhaps you're aiming for zero growth. You're just aiming for something that's sustainable and slower. You're not aiming, as you're suggesting, to just basically tip everything over and start again. Right. Well, the, the, there are, of course, a lot of people who are saying growth is not a good idea and we need to get away from growth. Uh, and and there's a good argument to be made in that direction, but I'm actually saying something quite different, which is that growth is no longer possible. And, uh, and we're not going to be able to just sort of level off where we are because, we, again, we've created this financial system that only works on the basis of, of growth. So without growth, it means we're, we're headed into contraction. And I think that's, that's more or less inevitable anyway on the basis of Okay. available energy. And if you're talking about sort of some implosion, or well, even if you're ma managing this change, I mean, I mean, my thought is we're heading towards another, we're heading towards a world war, or I mean, such conflict, if you are trans, if you're making that right. sort of transition. Right. Well, that, that could be an outcome. Um, a colleague of mine named Michael Clare, who uh, has written several books with titles like Blood and Oil, uh, makes the argument that we are headed into a period of increased uh, uh, political instability and international conflict. I don't think that necessarily has to be the outcome because, of course, if we have more international conflict, that simply destroys more of the available resources. So the, the, the wise thing would be to... Look on the bright side. <laughs> Listen, let's get the house lights up. I know, I mean, I yeah. could go in any direction with this, and I know there's lots of people eager out there to get some questions. Let's start, just the gentleman here, there's a microphone here, and then there was the, the guy... We'll come to the white head and then you. I know you put your hand up first, but please do. Oh, hello. Um, uh, could you say something about um, a sort of possible political model of this sort of type of reform? I mean, what comes to mind is kind of collective ownership or, you know, no competition. I mean, are you fundamentally against capitalism or is there some kind of natural capitalism, you know, which would be more equitable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if, if capitalism per se can, can survive this, this period of uh, you know, the end of growth and the beginning of contraction. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I'm not the advocate of any particular system to replace that, what, socialism, communism, whatever. Uh, these are, all of these political ideas really are relics of the 19th and 20th centuries when we had lots of cheap energy. So we're really going to have to invent new political models. And I, I, would, I would think that in this day of, of uh, um, you know, revolution and, and free information that only participatory, open, and transparent political models really are going to be uh, workable going forward. On which point, I should say, there's a gentleman in the front row who's recording all of this and is going to put it on YouTube if you wanted to see any of the slides, because I know you skipped over some of them earlier, apart from the pointers. Uh, so check out on YouTube. And now I promised somebody, who was the second person I promised the question to? Uh, the gentleman there. Thank you. Hello. Um, am I switched on? Yes. You are. Thank you. <laughs> I hope so. Let's have uh, what I'd like to do, mention is a couple of years ago, the British government at the time sponsored um, report an investigation by Tim Jackson, professor at Surrey University, mm -hmm. called Prosperity Without Growth. 
you're, I'm sure you're aware of that. I wonder if you think that's a remedy that Britain and the present government should take up because it's closed down the commission that funded it. Right, yeah, prosperity without growth. Uh, absolutely, that's, that's the direction of thinking uh, that every nation needs to be uh, pursuing. And Tim Jackson has done fantastic work in, in that regard. So if you all don't know his, uh, I forget the title of his Prosperity most recent group. Prosperity Without Growth. Prosperity Without, that's the title of his book, right. Uh, if you don't have that book, by, by all means, I recommend it. Okay. He's written a book as well. Yeah. Okay. Prosperity Without Go Growth, go um, Google it. Well, I, I, really, I really wanted to talk again about the political systems. Um, sorry to bring it up again. Um, uh, mainly a sort of, um, game plan for a politician or a political party who's looking to, um, to bring about this kind of political change, not what sort of change there should be, whether you have any ideas on that? Well, you know, it's really difficult uh, to, to have this conversation in a political context because every politician, of whatever stripe, argues for growth. It's just a question of will we get more growth by conservative or liberal or radical policies of one, one stripe or another. Uh, if we're in the situation that I've, I've described, that, that really is some, it's the worst nightmare uh, for any politician. Because no politician wants to go out in front of the people and say, well, sorry, you know, I don't, here, here's a problem for which we have no easy remedy. Uh, and we can't even blame it on the other party because we've all been part of this process of becoming more and more reliant on, on cheap energy and, and growth. So I think it's going to take a, a, a revolution within political circles to even begin to come to terms with this reality. And I think it's got to be discussed behind closed doors first. Uh, it's, it's important that we hold politicians' feet to the fire and, and bring up these issues, but until they feel that they have some kind of constituency like the transition towns that is where there are, there are people who are already understanding the situation and willing to make some sacrifices and pioneer some different ways of living, then I think it's going to be very, very difficult for politi politicians to get out of this. Well, the scale of transition towns, I know because we talked, I think it came up earlier in the day, has anybody got any sort of idea or of the scale of about 359 groups in Britain and a lot more worldwide. 359 groups. That's what I love, great on the internet. Well, sorry, but we, let's, we, let's, let's use the mic. Let's use the microphone, so otherwise, sorry. Hold on one second, because we can't hear you, so there's no point. We'll I, get a I mic to you. There's, there's, and there's about 300, there's, there's 30 in London, and there's three to 400 worldwide, and lots more that's money over. Well, I was looking for you, because you mentioned it this morning. Uh, the lady here. The trouble is that um, <clears throat> we can't, you know, we can start raising awareness, but we need political change because real change has to involve um, legislation. Right. Well, you're absolutely right. And at some point, what, what we've been seeing in Tunisia and Egypt and Libya is going to be happening in the US and the UK and... Uh, other nations uh, as well. We will see political unrest as the economy uh, begins to stagnate and, and come apart because that's the, the, that's the seedbed of, of, of political change and revolution. The question is, will we have the right tools lying around to pick up and employ to rebuild a, a new economy? Can I just get a show of hands? We did this a little earlier. It's possibly entirely meaningless. A straw poll of who's convinced by this idea that, you know, we've got to go through this wall to a, 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 a wall. A wall. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm using the metaphor of to, such total reform of the financial institutions so that you, because, not because you, so that because there will be no growth. Could you raise your hand if you buy the argument that's been put out? And could you put your hands down, and those of you who didn't have your hands up, put your hands up. Even if you're kind of media, you're not sure, but you know, just, good. Good, very interesting. Okay, there was a gentleman there who's been holding the microphone for a long time. Um, given that uh, China and India, about a third of the world's population are growing at 10% uh, a year, and the maths of exponential growth mean that they will have to double all the resources they've ever used 
within the next seven years. Um, do you think we've got less than seven years to sort ourselves out? <laughs> uh, well, yes, I, I, think, I think we will see um, s some roadblocks in the way of China and India uh, appearing within the next five to seven years and possibly the next two or three. Um, both of those economies have some, some uh, very serious challenges ahead. China, I'm, I'm, I'm actually more familiar with. I've, I've written a, a fair amount about it recently. And it's not only China's energy economy. China also has a, a property <coughs> bubble, a, a real estate bubble. It has a, a growth-based, uh, excuse me, an export-based um, uh, economic model that Japan showed back in the 1970s and 80s really leads nowhere. <coughs> We could go on and on, but uh, but the, these growth miracles that everyone's counting on to pull the rest of the world along, I think uh, well, I'm not, are not saying, capable of doing I'm not so. saying they're going to pull the rest of the world along, they're going to pull the rest of us down, yeah. because there's only limited amount of resources available, right. well, and we're going to have to do without so that China can keep growing. Yeah, to the extent that China can keep growing, but, but that's what that's what's it's happening right now. Scenario, yes, millions dying of starvation, presumably, or, or unable to get food. Uh, that is certainly a worst case scenario that is unfolding now, as, as as food prices rise. And part of the reason that food prices are rising is, as this gentleman says, uh, Chinese now uh, are wanting richer diets, uh, meat based diets that are. Lots of questions and no time. Uh, could you get to the gentleman? I've been staying too close to the mic. I'm sorry, guys. Uh